remind everybody that this session is being recorded. Um, uh, it's not been live streamed, but it is being recorded. So I'm just going to start by introducing myself. So my name is Bernadette Quinn, and I work in Technological University Dublin, where I'm a lecturer and a researcher, and I've got a strong um, research interest in arts festivals in particular, and in the arts as well. I'm, I'm a human geographer. So, and I'm currently the um, co principal investigator on an Irish Research Council funded project uh, which is looking at um, the implications of the digital turn for arts festivals, mainly those in rural areas. So we're, we're very interested in learning about the nature of the rural context and how that's affecting what's happening in the arts world at the moment. Uh, I mean, we all know that rural places are changing a lot. Um, I mean, we might even say that the art, that the rural places are in a period of tumultuous change at the moment. I mean, you've got the upheavals caused by climate change and changing demands being placed on farmers in terms of what they're producing. I mean, that's even being exacerbated now at the moment because of the war in Ukraine and um, supply, um, you know, f food security issues. Um, we've got um, changing demographics. We know our rural populations are changing. They're um, becoming increasingly ethnically diverse. Um, we know that we've got a search for um, better and different forms of energy, for example. So that's um, creating all kinds of challenges for rural society. In addition, then, we're all recovering. I mean, we're, we're still in, possibly, and emerging from and trying to recover from the dreadful effects of the pandemic, which has, of course, affected rural areas as well as urban areas. And we are still um, trying to come to terms with the impacts of Brexit, and um, maybe some parts of the country more than others. And in, in the midst of all of that change, then, we've got all of the, the rapid technological advances as we move into this digital world. And, um, you know, there's lots and lots of possibilities offered by digitization, but uh, we think, you know, there is difficulties perhaps associated with that as well. So we don't really know how all of that mix then is affecting how we live and work, how we produce, create, consume, engage with the arts in, 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 in all kinds of, of ways. Um, in, in, in rural places. So this is the kind of context then that sets the scene for our discussion this morning. And um, our panelists, who have been very good to join us this morning, have been asked to think and to prepare to talk about two questions. So the first question is, is, a, is a very big question, and we're certainly not going to answer it this morning, but we're just going to try and maybe shed some light from a, a few different perspectives on, you know, how do we understand the rural today in the context of making art? Because as we've just been saying, you know, the rural is undergoing such change. So how do we understand what we mean by the art? But by the, what we mean by um, the rural today in the context of making art. So that's our first question. And our second question then is around this digitization. You know, what challenges and opportunities are posed by digitization um, in the context of making art, consuming art, producing art in rural places today? So those are our two big questions. And in, in having this conversation over the next while, we're, we're trying to get a better understanding of how we might co-create a better future really for people who live in rural places and co-create a better future for art in in the context of rural places so like I mean uh, you know I'm a geographer and a core question is I mean does it matter you know whether you live in a rural place or in an urban place for how you make art how you can access art and um, how you can experience art today it's a very simple question um, but it's hard to answer. And, and then, of course, we're just trying to get some insight into how, as we move forward in this world, which is increasingly um, mediated by digital technology, um, what does that mean for those who are involved in, in making, producing, consuming arts in rural places? So now, throughout the discussion, of course, we've got our panelists speaking, but of course, we are mad keen to hear what you have to say. So um, we would really, really like to hear your comments and your questions. So what we're asking you to do is to put those comments and questions into the chat as they occur to you throughout the session. It doesn't really matter how big or how small they are. Just pop your thoughts into the chat, and then we'll keep an eye on those, and we'll pick them up as we go through the session, and certainly in the Q&A at the end. OK, so now on to the speakers.
So this morning we had invited five people to join us on the panel, but unfortunately Pierce Doherty is not going to be able to with us this morning, um, which is unfortunate, and we pass our best wishes on to him. And we had hoped also to have Maya Thomas, uh, a visual scribe, um, talk to us as well um, and, and graphically harvest the work, but she's not able to be with us this morning either. However, we are going to give her the recording from the session and we're going to give her some notes and we will ask her to produce uh, an image of our discussions and we will share them with you all later um, on social media. Um, so, to the speakers. Um, now, full details on all the speakers are on the conference program, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, I'm just going to give brief introductions. So we're going to start this morning with Siobhan Mulcahy, who's actually with me this morning in Carlo. Um, she's our highly experienced uh, County Arts Officer from County Clare. And then Siobhan is going to be followed by Dara McGee, who's joining us this morning remotely. Um, Dara has worked in the arts in a number of different capacities, and he's now the Artistic Director at Aris Aina Arts Centre on Inishore, the Aran Islands. So um, he'll be giving us couple of different perspectives and a very peripheral geographical perspective this morning. Um, then we're going to go to Hina Khan, who's a Cork-based visual artist, and she's joining us remotely as well. And she's going to bring us an artist's perspective to the table. And then she'll be followed then by Dr. Emer O'Connor, who's um, coming from us, um, from Anna McCarrig up in County Monaghan as the director of the Tyrone Guthrie Centre. So we've got a different variety of perspectives, people who work in different parts of the arts world, people living and working in different geographic locations, and maybe experiencing different kinds of dynamics in, in the rural places where they live. So, without further ado then, I'm going to hand over to Siobhan and ask her to give us her thoughts on the two questions, um, please. So, Siobhan, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Bernadette. So, I'm delighted to be here this morning, just to start off by saying that. And, you know, the, the title of the, the conference is Places Matter, and places very much matter. Um, I'm an arts officer with the local authority. Local authorities exist because places matter. We're serving our local communities, and being an arts officer in a rural local authority, I suppose rural places matter very much to, to ourselves. Um, but language matters also, interrogating what we mean by rural places. Um, and that notion raises a lot of questions, like what is rural? Is it anywhere outside of Dublin? Is it anywhere outside of the urban centres? Um, is Ennis a rural town? Port Leash, Carlo? Would the people who live in those towns consider themselves to be rural people? So I think it's important that when we speak about rural, we're not speaking in terms of place so much, maybe as in terms of a rural context. Um, uh, so it's not just a specific geographical concept um, and this in turn then will lead to a much uh, more deeply layered and multifaceted and nuanced discussion really and um, my colleague Sinead Dowling the arts officer in Carlo she, she phrased it lovely actually by when you talk about rural arts um, making art in that context relates to the local and helps to form local identity it reveals something about a place and hold relevance holds relevance to a community of interest um, and they're all things that permeate very deeply when we're talking about art in the rural. Uh, it's over 20 years now since Fiona Woods would have curated the Ground Up um, Contemporary Arts Project uh, in County Clare, um, whereby we commissioned local, national and international artists to come and to work with local communities um, to create works of relevance to those communities. And I'm not saying that this work wasn't happening elsewhere or wasn't happening prior to this, but it was probably one of the first times that we sort of interrogated the notion of a rural context in terms of creating artworks um, and in terms of um, developing a discussion around that. Um, because that rural context, it shapes and creates exemplary art practices by individual artists. Um, and I suppose just to reiterate when we say artists as well, it's artists across all art forms. It's our writers, our visual artists, dancers, musicians, filmmakers. Um, the romantic notion of artists moving to rural areas to be inspired by the landscape is still very, very valid across a wide range of art forms. 
but I think that that notion has been further developed because the artists, um, the context offers artists a depth of experience that enables them to respond in a variety of ways to local issues, local people and communities of interest. And you outlined some of those issues um, very well at the outset, um, Bernadette, and unfortunately, you know, you could have a session on each one of those individually. But um, rural, it's, you know, it's, it's a very, very vibrant and dynamic sector um, of society at the moment um, because of the amount of opportunities and challenges that it faces. Uh, faces. Um, and often local authorities are actually to the forefront of creating the parameters for artists to make those responses. Um, in particular, I think the Arts Council's Invitation to Collaborate scheme, which enables local authorities to work in partnership with one another, has created some really interesting um, projects. There's one in particular at the moment um, with the arts offices in Carlow, Kildare and Meath County Council, where they're working with their regional climate office and the environment sections in each of those local authorities and they're working in bog communities so they're working with communities out in local bogs sharing the learnings and responding to these sites as sites of inquiry and exchange um, and all then related back to the urgency of climate action um, so that would be one but then there are other issues in rural areas that are far more generic to society um, you know for example we're working on a project again through invitation to collaborate with um, partners in County Galway and Mayo local authorities um, and we're mapping arts and disability provision in the area um, and I think it's just important to say that these issues it's not that the local authorities are, are plucking them out of the air but these are our ways of responding to issues that are being raised on the ground and in and amongst um, local rural communities as well um, so it's not arbitrary um, the other thing that struck me yesterday as part of the conference was the Creative Places programme. And I really think that is going to be a game changer um, in the next decade in terms of developing rural um, arts contexts in Ireland. Um, it's a slow burn, but it's a deep, deep investment in places and in people. And I suppose we have to remember that, that you know, places are made up of people. That's the very, very essence of it. But the particular thing I would say about creative places and even the invitation to collaborate and the, the longer term projects that local authorities often work on with artists is time. And you cannot put a value on time. Um, the world is changing so rapidly, we've all seen that in the last couple of years, but having the time to respond and to process, and while you know, we appreciate that certain things need immediate action, um, time to expand our understanding of what's going on around us, um, whilst being conscious of the urgency of that, is absolutely imperative, I think, in terms of the arts in a rural context. Um, Many of the projects that I've mentioned previously were enabled to continue during the pandemic because of digitization, um, you know, online through Zoom. And the fact that we're meeting in person today and that people are joining us today online, you know, in, in many, like five years ago, this would nearly have been unheard of or it would have been so out there in terms of, um, you know, access and including people and being able to, um, you know, for, for our audience to be able to ask questions or pose thoughts. And that interaction is, is wonderful. Um, we've seen a huge and remarkably quick rollout, I think, in terms of digital hubs and broadband connection points all over Ireland. Um, it's quite phenomenal, really, that, you know, this really, you know, in the space of three to five years that this has happened um, throughout Ireland and in rural communities and offers people and artists, either individually or artist communities, ways to connect that were in many ways um, unheard of previously. Um, it also brings access, I think, to quality in art making in terms of new, new ideas, um, access to researching, research development, um, technological advances in artists' own practices as well. Um, but it also brings challenges, and it brings challenges, I think, for, for society as a whole, but probably for artists in particular, to disconnect 
and to pull back because many artists go to get away from the busyness of life um, and digitization has almost brought that, you know, it's brought it to your phone as such. It's very hard sometimes to switch off and to concentrate on art making. Um, it also can never, ever replace the importance of coming together as a community. And that is really, really valued in a rural context for shared experiences such as, you know, arts events, arts participation, concerts, etc. And we know that COVID really particularly impacted on these types of experiences. But for many in rural areas, there's still significant disenfranchisement. Just, you know, they're particularly disenfranchised people and communities as well, um, and have been for a long time, because issues around basic transport facilitation haven't necessarily been overcome. They may have been improved, but the actual physical, you know, having to go somewhere to see something, that's still a huge issue for many people out in rural areas. Broadband connectivity issues, um, again, hugely important. And while it's wonderful to have the, have the hubs and the points um, as opportunities for people to go in to get high quality broadband, you know, again, there are a limited amount of people who can actually access them. Um, so the general connectivity is a huge issue as well. And the other then is, I think, targeting the more marginalized in our communities and in rural communities. Um, the incredible opportunities that digitization has brought to us has actually exponentially increased the digital divide. So much effort and work in the last two years in particular went into upskilling um, sections of our community. I'm thinking of maybe older age, um, upskilling them to ensure that they remained um, connected um, through COVID to overcome loneliness and isolation, um, to assist with their well-being. And phenomenal, the work that was done across local authorities, across state agencies, community groups. But those who didn't get that, um, for whatever reason, that divide now is absolutely massive. You know, we didn't get to everyone. And because, you know, the rising boat lifts, or the rising tide lifts all boats, the boats that didn't make it onto that tide are so far beyond now. I think it is a real worry in terms of us and a challenge for us in terms of providing access um, to those members of our communities um, in rural areas. And to, to, it probably makes it even a little bit more difficult to go out and reach those people in terms of our practice uh, and what we do and how we do it. So I don't want to finish on a negative note. No. I suppose I, I see it maybe as a, as a challenge for us to, um, to think about how mm. we can um, mm. assist and how we can reach those that are most mm. marginalised in mm. rural communities. Yeah. Uh, no, no, thanks, Siobhan. No, you covered um, a wide range of issues there, I think. Um, some very striking points that I hope we're going to get time to, to go back to. I mean, I, I, I appreciate you talking about not, not place as such, but context and bring, bringing up the people. But I think you, you, you know, you, you talked about kind of the, you know, the physical or natural dimensions of place in, in, in talking about the natural landscapes and the bog projects, for example. And you're very much picking up on social context there in the ending of, of your contribution, which I think is so important. And hopefully we'll get back to that again as we move on. But now I'm going to turn to Dara and ask Dara if he's able to come in now and share a few thoughts. Okay, um, thanks very much for having me today and hello everybody. Um, I suppose uh, the question we're asked is how can we understand the rural in the context of making art today? Well, where I work, uh, it doesn't get more rural. Um, I'm working in Oris Eina Art Centre on Inishir. It's the most westerly art centre in Europe. The island has a population of 280 and we're in existence just over 20 years. So a brief history to how Orisena came about, because um, I think this is important uh, because it, uh, it is a big part of the island community and it is a rural community. Um, in the 80s, Mick Mulcahy uh, rented an old weaving factory on the island uh, to do some work for the Biennial. And some of his friends saw the work and said it needed to be exhibited. So they cleaned out this old weaving factory and they hung his massive canvases and people came to see it and an art centre was born and it opened in 1990. And ever since then, the island community have been welcoming artists uh, to Inishir on residencies, 
Um, we have a theatre there. We do concerts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we've de we've developed a, a, a lot since, and I have to say that the past two years um, with the restrictions on COVID was a big blessing in disguise for Orizena because we we needed to think differently. We always had this connection with um, artists coming um, to the community, and the community are used to having artists on the island, which is a, a, a very important point because. If it's a new thing to a community, sometimes it can be fears in the community or oh, what's happening here. There's a group of artists after coming in. We don't know who they are, et cetera, et cetera. But in a sheer uh, community, welcome open uh, with open arms, artists to the island um, from all art forms. And as I said, for over 20 years, we've been inviting artists um, to this beautiful island to come and find space for themselves and to find time and um, uh, to, to uh, immerse themselves in, in the environment and the community and the culture and their own thought and artwork and, and create great art. Um, so we provide an access to artists into a rural area. We are very lucky that we can provide this access. There's a lot of rural areas that don't have access. There's other islands I could name that don't have the access or the facilities. Um, and as well as the physical environment, um, the community I can see has a huge impact, a huge impact on the majority of the artists uh, that come uh, and to, to stay with us and to work and create on in this year. Um, uh, it's very, very few artists I've come uh, upon that, that keep to themselves and, and, and don't get involved somehow with the community, whether it's whether they're out on a walk and they're meeting a man building a stone wall or they're talking to the fishermen or they're down talking to the knitting group or, or they're talking to people in the shop or whatever it may be. Um, and I really want to emphasize the positive thing, the, the, the connection between the artists and the community. It's absolutely fantastic. It's absolutely magical. And it's, um, uh, I, I, I even have Islanders ask me, who's coming out next and what do they do? You know, when they see jugglers out of the back of the island juggling stones or, or um, acrobats or painters or dancers, or um, they, they have an interest. And as well as that, I think they're probably the luckiest school kids in Ireland because nearly all our artists that come voluntarily go to the school and give a talk about where they're from, what part of the world they're from, their history. They might show slides of their work. I don't know any other school in the country um, that, that has such an education uh, a free education from all these visiting artists that come to the island. So um, uh, that that's kind of the, the whole rural uh, thing. Now, not only that, what Orizena do with their program, um, we have other festivals that aren't aligned with or with directly with Orizena, like the Drop Everything Festival and Fail in the Gluck. And again, these are all welcomed. Um, the welcome to artistic activities that happen on the island. There is a summer tourism season when the island is very busy from June to September. Um, that's when a lot of uh, concerts might happen and uh, uh, maybe theatre theater gigs and that because of, of live audiences. Uh, with a population of 280, it's very hard to, um, to se sell shows in the off season. So that moves me right forward to um, the digitization and, and COVID and the lockdown and what happened in the past two years um, with Orisena. So we've had a lot of exciting things happen. For example, we had the Abbey Theatre's production of Samuel Beckett's Lane the Sonna, which we um, which was rehearsed in Orisena. In it was done in collaboration with Orisena, um, directed by Sarah Jane Scaife. And uh, we, ha we had our Karcha exhibition, which was an exhibition of 21 Karaks celebrating Orizena's 21st birthday. And these Karaks were all outdoor, bar eight of them, which were in the theatre. And they were all around the island. So it became a promenade um, art exhibition, which uh, has been a huge success and traveled to uh, the National University of Ireland in Galway. Um, we had Michael T. Higgins out visiting uh, both of those shows. Um, we have Maureen Fleming as part of a Guggenheim Fellowship uh, coming to us in June. So we have all these things that are happening and we started thinking about the island as an art centre rather than the actual building. Okay, we have our building, we have our studios, we have our theatre, but we also have the island and we have a community that welcomes artists. 
and it has worked an absolute treat for us. And then by applying for various grants to the department, we got a grant for um, streaming equipment for cameras and, and microphones and booms. And we got a capacity building grant to train a local crew on the island. So now we, are, we, we have a small crew on the island with our, with our um, cameras uh, and streaming facilities um, that we can interview artists all year round. Artists can talk about their work they're doing on in Ishir in such a beautiful remote island. Um, we can stream concerts, we can do projects with the schools. Um, and not only that, uh, our Facebook following is, since COVID started, has shot up from somewhere we were around four or 500 followers to 5,600 followers. Um, any of our Aris Anabio gigs in what we started doing in the very, at the very start when, uh, of the first lockdown, um, we contacted um, artists of all art forms and asked them would they be happy to perform from home, like a lot of people were doing. And by the end of each week, there was uh, an average of 7,000 hits on every one of our 20 plus um, streams that are free streams that we did on Facebook Live. It was very basic and whatever. And I think that's where the penny dropped for us because we have a problem as in we don't have an audience to sell to bar the three months in the summer. So our audience, we are convinced now comes from digitization and every artist needs an audience. Um, and that's where our plan is, is going now. We also expanded our artist residency from one studio to three studios and we've rented a house for artists. So at any one time on Inishir, we have three artists living on the island or the summer months because you can't rent a house on the island in the summer months because they're all pre-booked for tourists. But it's been a very positive experience for us. Um, I know there's been a lot of negativity about COVID and I hate being here being all cheery, cheery, cheery and it's all been great, but it actually has in its own funny way because it, it got us to think in a different way which really suits a rural place like Inishir with a population of 280 people. Thank you very much, Tara. Um, that's just so interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I suppose, you, you, you know, you're talking from a very particular kind of a rural place. Um, but it's just so interesting to hear your experience of the last uh, few years and how you have, I suppose, profited from it and really saw potential there with the digitization. That's just, just so, so interesting. Um, and, and, and the idea of, you know, the, the, the art centre now encompassing the entire island and the people who live on the island, you know, that's a, that's a really um, interesting idea that I'd love to hear more about. Um, okay, so thank you very much, Dara. Uh, so we might pick on, up on some of that later. So now we're going to move to Hina Khan, who's going to speak as an artist as a practicing artist, um, so she's going to bring a different um, perspective. So over to you, Hina. Hina, we can't actually hear you, Hina. I think you're on mute. No, can't still, still can't hear you. Can you? Hi, everyone. Now, perfect, perfect. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> my name is Ina Khan and my practice is uh, all about uh, uh, paintings and uh, things like that. But uh, as, an, uh, as an artist from ethnic minority background, I stayed, uh, I was living in County Mayo, I was living in County Leash and, I was, and currently I'm based in Kinsale. So uh, I have experience about uh, to live in different counties. So while I was living in Mayo, there is uh, uh, definitely when you are living in the rural context, uh, live into the rural part of the world, it is really connect you to the nature as an artist and you feel very calm and uh, it will, uh, improve your productivity of art and you can think differently uh, uh, in, in contrast of the urban uh, <clears throat> settings. But uh, like there is some problems as well, like uh, when I was living in Valley Harness, I, I strongly feel these things like I cannot connect to the um, uh, connect to the uh, connect to the art world and I'm trying to find out then uh, arts council officer uh, county Mayo came and they, she uh, 
saw my work and she guided me in the way. And there is some uh, short courses are uh, happening in ETB. That is the main starting point of me because I didn't understand the culture and I was new here in Ireland in 2015. So that is the starting point as an artist. And I, I find that it is not just me. There is a lot of artists, a group of artists in Valley Hornets, they are living uh, there and they are struggling with the connectivity and sometimes it is a big problem for them to drop the work into different venues and uh, uh, transportation and uh, these kind of things are uh, are a trouble for uh, the people. That's why in the rural areas, sometimes parents didn't recommend their children to go in the art, uh, uh, go uh, select the art as a as a profession. So uh, these kind of things uh, happen and I find these things as well. But uh, uh, the intercultural officer, uh, she connect, she connect me because uh, definitely when you come into a new culture, you don't know how to, uh, how to talk to people and how to uh, deliver your work, uh, how to discuss about the art, but sometimes it is uh, uh, it is quite challenging, but uh, intercultural officer in County Mayo, she helped me and the uh, arts council officer, she come and see my work and she told me like how I can navigate, how can I, I can extend my practice. And it's it's really important, like I was living in Valley Honest, if you guys know, it's a very small town, but uh, like I am uh, constantly working with the local group of artists and like it helps me, they guide me like how I can, uh, go through with different uh, things and uh, like I really find these uh, these things are they are working since like 12 15 years they are running uh, an exhibition over there but uh, like there is no visibility of that exhibition there is no reviews there is no um, like uh, nobody is I think uh, it's not very visible in the sense of uh, buying there they don't have any buyers they don't have any uh, like curators over there so like now they are fed up and I think uh, I heard like they are not doing uh, now these uh, they are not doing just they are doing their studio practice they are not exhibiting their work anymore but uh, like this, these things are happen while I'm living in uh, County Mayo but when I uh, I I shifted into Kinsale. They, uh, I got in a studio and uh, here people are coming and see my work and that's how, uh, like, uh, I there is a big problem of transportation and things, but uh, uh, but as a perspective of artists, like uh, uh, the uh, county uh, cork is much better than the uh, in terms of uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> in terms of uh, uh, connecting uh, with the. Uh, with the art people, art curators, and uh, 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 and I really feel like uh, opportunity came uh, through Fire Station and create collaborative art, and that helps me a lot to grow and to develop my connections to the art world. And it not it is not happened to every artist. It happens to me because that opportunity is for the ethnic minority background or for the person who is uh, from a different culture. So these kind of thing happens to me um, and I really uh, appreciate these things. Uh, through that I'm growing uh, my uh, art practice and it helps me a lot. And through the digital media, I'm connecting to Pakistani artists. I'm connecting to some artists in, in New York uh, and I did an artist talk and I connect. So I really feel like digitization is a very good and powerful thing. Before I was traveling a lot, like four hours traveling to go for one hour meeting, but now it helps me, I think, as well as it helps all the artists in connectivity and I'm doing a lot of collaborative projects. So uh, like in the rural area, like uh, I, I went for a residency in Skibreen and that's how I built up some uh, working develop, uh, working collaboration with filmmakers and different artists who are doing res residencies at the same time. So these are kind of uh, thing which is really uh, after the COVID and after the, uh, the digital things, it is really helpful for the artists who are living in isolation. They are all connected and they are working in a, a collective project. So it is kind of very uh, positive thing in the way like uh, we are all, uh, we are not suffered through the times.
like we are saving the time and we are connecting a lot of audience even globally so that's it <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Hina. I, I mean, I think what, what, what you brought us there now is this individual perspective. You know, we've, we, Dara had us right in the, we really could feel a community um, with Dara. And now you've brought us down into just what, the voice of one artist. Uh, and of course, you're not representative of all artists, but you're giving us an artist take. And I, and I think you're, you're kind of linking back to Siobhan because you're bringing us in um, um, an emphasis on the importance of supports and infrastructures like that are provided through the local authority uh, uh, offices, which, I, which, which is, is obviously very, very important everywhere. And I think you, we're also beginning to see coming through when we talk about digitization, which I think you're appreciating the positives of, you know, this idea of while we're talking about places here, we're really seeing, you know, transcending borders and links between places being um, fostered. Um, and, and that came through very strongly in Dara as well. Um, but places being linked up um, and borders being broken down a, a little um, through digitization. So thank you very much for your contribution. Um, so now our final speaker is going to be Emer. Um, up in Monaghan, so I hope Emer is still there. And over to you, Emer. Lovely. We can see you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Bernadette. And thank you very much for organizing this panel. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure. Um, I'm actually going to read my paper, if you don't mind, because my internet <laughs> is very unstable, but we'll get to that. Um, so I've been resident director here at the Jerome Guthrie Centre in County Monaghan since January 2021, and I can tell you it was quite a time to move in and take up the role in the middle of COVID that has already been spoken about. It was an opportunity in many ways too. We are in the middle of 400 acres plus in a very rural area of County Monaghan. We're funded by the two arts councils on the island of Ireland, and I'll talk about that a bit more. And we've been open for 40 years, offering residential workspace to local, national and international artists and people that work to support the arts across all art forms. So for residents, actually being here in this place, however temporarily, offers time and space to be, as was mentioned earlier this morning, and to think, and to walk, and to talk, and to make good work, and importantly, to collaborate with other like-minded people. So being rural in our case is absolutely fundamental to our offer to artists. I'm going to talk a little bit around accessibility and diversity and inclusion because they are aspects of our work that are vitally important here. We're, we're on the border uh, with Northern Ireland with the six counties of Northern Ireland. We do our utmost here to make space for all and we do this through our work with arts officers north and south and by creating specific bursary opportunities and other points of entry with like-minded organisations north and south. And we also have a series of in-house bursaries to create um, points of entry um, across everybody on the island. We are and always will remain a quiet residential workspace, a place of tranquility and uh, out outside the bustle of everyday life. But more recently and largely because of COVID, we've become far more aware of the importance of an online presence in terms of, as mentioned earlier, Facebook, Twitter and other platforms and while we were closed due to COVID, we managed to raise our online audience from a trickle of a few hundred to well over 5,000 on Facebook now. And we have thousands on Twitter and many on Instagram. I'm not so good on, on LinkedIn at the moment. We've also become, interestingly, and this is very new for the centre, but very keenly aware of the necessity to be able to host online conference style meetings so that our residents here can attend meetings with their publishers and gallerists or their editors, and indeed give papers or readings while they're resident with us. So they're connecting out from here in another way. So the ability to do these activities online while yet making the most of rural peace and quiet that we offer has become an absolute necessity for many, although not all of our residents. So there was a couple of points about being an artist residence in a rural border environment of the 21st Have we lost Emer? It's out Emer's side, is it? Yeah. Um, Sorry, do you, okay. you lost me there? Yeah, we lost you there. I, You're back so again. 
it is our connectivity. It's quite funny, uh, Bernard Jack, and you were introducing me. I froze here as well. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to I'm going to read through this very quickly because it really is very bad here. It's just demonstrating itself. So it's lack of internet, uh, stable internet coverage in the rural areas, and the cost of internet provision in rural areas where there's no fibre broadband. Um, internet access is essential to what we do, and we need to be continually stable so that we can avoid this. Yeah, it's her, her, lost, she's proving her point. <laughs> yeah, I, we've we lost you again, Emer, have we? I think this is what we mean by embodied sorry, performance. I, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I know it's mad, isn't it? I'm really sorry, but I, I'm not joking. It's playing havoc with our, with our situation here. So what I wanted to say was that the rollout of broadband across the country is being delayed owing to the pandemic, but the completion of that work will reduce the overall cost for rural-based artists and organizations. And will mean, and this is an important point, that we are all on an equal footing in terms of the digital age, no matter where we are based. I think that's really important. And the second issue I need to touch upon, because we're a border organization here and cross-border funded, and I hope we can pick up on it, is our connectedness in general or otherwise to our artists and art worker colleagues in Northern Ireland. I raise this under the rubric of accessibility and diversity, largely because we are based on the border there are several All-Ireland organisations, as we know, and the two arts councils on the island of Ireland work hard to enable this facilitation. Can you still hear me, Bernadette? Yeah, oh, Emer, you're fine, yeah. Okay. yeah. So for us, accessibility and inclusion also means thinking about artists and organisations on the island of Ireland, including Northern Ireland, many of whom are also living and working in rural settings. We do our utmost here at the Centre to encompass all artists by partnering with organisations such as Dance Ireland and Poetry Ireland, the All Ireland organisations, and by with organisations, uh, arts officers and smaller organisations north and south. And we're considering ways in which to bring artists north and south together here to the Centre to facilitate discussion and hopefully collaboration at that one-to-one -one level. And I suppose one of the questions I'd like to raise this morning, if I may, is I'd be kind of interested to hear how Somebody doesn't want you to ask the question. <laughs> We've lost you again, Emer. We're mad to know what the question is. Emer, if you can hear me, if you can't speak, you know, put your question in the chat. We're, we're dying to know what the question is. Um, uh, you know, oh, the question is, my question was about collaboration. <laughs> oh, pop it in the chat, Emer. Pop it in the chat. Um, I'm sorry, Emer. We're 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 so losing you. Um, are you able to pop, to to? Um, my question was about whether um, I'll I'll raise it again, Bernie. I'll put it in I'll put it into the box. But I'm interested to know how many small arts organisations are collaborating collaborating with artists in Northern Ireland. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Um, okay. I think for for us, it's very important here. Um, so I'm going to try and finish up what I was going to say. I'm, I'm really sorry about this. Oh, and it's um, not your fault. It's so okay. So being, being rural and digitization are challenges, obviously, uh, but, there are, but there are many great opportunities uh, attached to both. Uh, meetings are fantastic online, but as mentioned already, there's nothing like the book launch or the exhibition or having people here with us or there with you. No. And we know that an online presence allows broader access to art events for those who may not be in a position to travel. So that's about accessibility and inclusion. But of course, we all need to have stable access to affordable internet to be able to do that, whether that's audiences or artists or arts organizations. Mm. So balance is key. So whether you're an artist, an arts organization, audience, you can't have that balance if your online presence is disturbed by lack of rural internet infrastructure. If I can, I would just like to, to finish by, by quoting a colleague from Northern Ireland who wrote to me about a group of Northern Irish female poets who recently spoke at, or in the last couple of years, spoke at Great Book Festival. And one of the women said that artists are perceived to bring with them honesty and integrity, to which I would add that is an, it, this is an integrity that frequently engages itself with important social issues. And it's for this reason and so many others that artists and the arts are so important to everyday life. 
and that an enterprise such as Shared Ireland, the Shared Ireland Initiative, which I hope we get to talk about, is such an excellent idea. And that conferences such as this are so incredibly useful to get us all talking and thinking from our different perspectives. And that we in the arts all have a role to play in ensuring a space for all in the arts, because although places matter, uh, or what I really want to say is because places matter, no matter the place. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you, Bernadette. Thanks a million, Emer, and sorry about those connectivity. Please stay on if, if you can at all, and if you have anything well, further, pop it into the chat. Um, okay, really, really interesting there, um, and sort of classic that you were interrupted with um, connectivity issues, which really is so relevant for what we're talking about. So you um, encouraged us to think um, about the all-island dimension which is really interesting, I think. And, and to remember, of course, you know, that there are rural places, um, you know, um, north of the border as well. And, um, you know, you asked that question that I think you did want an answer to, and I'm just going to ask it, ask it again of, of people in the audience and pop into the chat if you can answer it. You know, do we know, are there many small organizations out there actually collaborating um, with others um, like them, I suppose, north of the border? If you have any thoughts on that, um, pop them into the chat, please. So we're, was somebody going to say something there? In fact, uh, um, perhaps um, Dara or Hina or Siobhan might like to come in on that one. Well, I suppose just from my perspective, um, I don't know a huge amount, um, but that's not to say that people aren't working quietly away on their own private relationships mm. that they may have um, with people. But one of the things that we would have in Clare is, for example, we would be twinned with Nuri and Morn. Um, with, the, with the district and that, that town twinning, I think, um, <laughs> or, or regional twinning offers potential and possibilities for making connections um, between rural areas, um, north and south, because I'm assuming that other local authorities are twinned with other areas mm. throughout the country yes, as well. So uh, while I'm not aware of them, mm. there's certainly perhaps a channel there um, that could be um, exploited mechanism. and a mechanism yeah. to, for people to make connections if yeah. they don't already exist. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Yeah. I, I, I wonder how does that town twinning idea work and does it have a, a, an arts dimension and have mm -hmm. we thought about that? Yeah. It's, 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 it's something that will be worth pursuing. Um, Hina or Dara, would you like to come in on that one before we go into the chat and pick up the general comments? No? Um, just Dara, your mic there. Sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, well, since, since I've been involved with RSA and five years there now, um, the only, um, I suppose, the, collab the only collaboration I've had with a Northern Ireland artists was through a partnership we have with the, um, the RHA, and we selected a Northern Irish artist, emerging artist, to do a residency with us uh, two summers ago. Um, but it, it's a, a very interesting question, and as somebody who graduated from the Belfast College of Art, um, it is something I should look at, and when I think back a, a long, long time ago, I contributed a painting to an exhibition that was held to raise funds in Ratlin Island, so I don't know whether I should look into something like that. But um, my policy in um, is that uh, we're open to all, we're open to all art forms, and of course I'd be open to an all-island uh, approach. Okay. Okay, thank you. I, I'm just going into the chat here, um, starting from the top, and I see Mary Weir has kicked us off there. Hi, Mary. Um, and and she's, she's saying that there's lots of opportunities to invite people to come in to uh, work with people in rural areas to create responses. And, and Dara spoke about that um, very engagingly, about how artists actually get involved with the local people and respond to local places. And um, so that, that's a, that's a, a very... Um, dynamic and interesting kind of idea. Um, I've got a lot of, uh, I'm struggling a little bit here. Um, so Lucy has just said, Dara, you forget that Cicada Circus, um, um, who did a month residency with last October, are based in Belfast. Um, <laughs> Emer is saying there, uh, I think we've got, she's advocating the all-island approach between artists and arts organisations. It would be great to see the RHA and the RUA link up, for example. Yes, um, I'm sure there must be absolutely lots of, sco of scope for that to happen. Um, 
I'm just seeing what else is in the chat here. Um, yeah, so that, that's, that's, that's a, a real idea. Uh, just Lucy there again. Um, whoops, I've lost the chat there. Sorry about that now. Um, oh yeah, okay, now, so let me see. What else there? Hina, so Lucy's thanking Hina. Connecting globally has never been more important to our artists, seeing the world through the widest possible perspective. Mm -hmm. um, Rory is saying, so interesting that the growth in social media is an indicator for success. Okay, right, now this is maybe an interesting one. So there's a massive need for a conversation around the ethics or partnering with companies such as these, as well as, of course, the practicalities. I mean, I thought actually, Rory, that I, I thought when you started there, I mean, I was wondering about, one thing I'd been wondering when people were talking was, so audience is growing in size, but who is in the audience? So, and are they the actual people that you really want to connect with? So is it just numbers or, or, or is that digital reach? Is it actually reaching who you want to reach? Or, or I just thought that was an interesting question. And now Rory is problematizing this saying about the ethics and of partnering with companies um, involved in here. I don't know if anybody on the panel has a burning need to come in on that one. Emer, have you got your um, camera or your, do you want to come in on that? You, are you on mute? I think that's a really important question, Ashley, and certainly I've been involved in a few online panels where you know people behave very inappropriately in the audience. That, that's the first thing I'd like to say. It does happen. Mm. And and secondly, the issue of um, ethical comp um, the, the ethical issue is a very important one in this day and age. And, and certainly here we are interested in linking up with companies that are. Uh, associated with climate change and, and uh, you know, the reducing our carbon footprint and that sort of thing, we wouldn't, for instance, um, hook up with, with certain types of companies, which I don't really want to get into, but, you know, uh, I think we have to think, we have to use a moral compass, there's no question. Yeah, and then Roy then goes on, not only, I mean, I had been thinking about the audiences, but then he goes on to think about the artists. Yes, I've got three minutes left. Um, this conversation is only starting, isn't it? We really must try and think of ways of continuing this conversation, actually. Um, maybe I'll, I'll talk to the panelists afterwards. We've had such quality contributions here. There's lots in the chat there about issues, uh, about ideas about connecting north and south. There's also, somebody's raised a problem there about the problems with getting funding in the south to continue work of that nature. Um, the global connectivity idea. Connectivity is a, is a huge idea coming up in the, in the chat. Um, it's a couple of new messages. And any of the panelists like to come in and respond to anything, please turn on your mic, Dara or Siobhan, if you'd like to, to say something. Well, I suppose I just wanted to pick up on one of the points that Hina had made just, you know, from the artist's perspective, and she was talking about um, the importance of networking and making those connections with other artists or arts organisations. So I'll um, unashamedly plug um, the Platform 31 that the Association of Local Authority Arts Officers have at the moment, and it's a bursary and mentoring support for artists. So one artist per county um, will receive it. It's supported by the Arts Council, um, but as I say, by the association, and the closing date is Monday. So if there are artists interested maybe in um, looking at that, to go on to the um, Platform 31 website and they'll see that because that mentoring, the bursary obviously is hugely welcome to artists after the time that we've had, but that mentoring and networking um, is of particular importance, I think, and, you know, listening to how it impacted on, on Hina in terms of her own practice, um, I, I think it goes to show that, you know, we are all social beings as well and talking to like-minded people in terms of our own development as well is is very very important yeah okay okay thanks for for mentioning that Siobhan it, you're allowed to make a plug <laughs> and actually if I, I've just popped in Hina's Instagram and Gmail details there because um, we agreed that I would do that and I popped in the clear arts um, web address so Dara and Emer if you'd like to pop in um, you know contact details for the Tyrone go three or for the Arts Centre in Sheer please do um, I think we're probably going to 
um, be asked to draw to a close. Are we at this point? Okay, so at this point then, um, I'm just going to thank everybody. And um, thank you, Siobhan, for being with me um, in person here. Um, uh, but thank you, Hina, Dara, and Emer, um, for being with us remotely. It wasn't quite as good as having you here in the room, but it was brilliant. And thank you to everybody who attended our session, listened to our session, um, made contributions. Thank you so much. We've had a lovely time, actually. Um, so now we'll go and join the, the, the rest of the conference in person. We're so pleased to have had you with us. And um, hopefully, we so much still to talk about, yes, as Rachel has said there in the end. And um, hopefully, we'll manage to find ways to keep this conversation going. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye.